This is Big Girl Pants Podcast, where we talk about women, health, power, and wealth. Hosted by April Melton and Kimberly Shapiro. We are real women with real jobs doing real life. Join us while we showcase inspirational stories and inspirational people. Come on, y'all. Put your big girl pants on and stay Stay tuned. tuned. So I want to talk about coming back Mm -hmm. and trying to fit in as a civilian, Mm -hmm. what that was like for both of you. You guys are kind of soft. Why are you guys so sensitive? Me? The civilians in general. Yeah. <laughs> but I also was about to say, I feel like this is where you'll find, you'll if, if Ian's anything like me, yeah. this is where the conversation will become much, much less jovial. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. You know, if that makes That's sense. Why I'm right. yeah. to like, can you, can you tell this is my like serious tone? Is, is that your this serious, serious voice? podcast tone? But I mean, I, you know, initially when I pitched this, um, this episode slash this conversation to you guys too, I wanted to talk about the PTSD and what that looks like and how it manifests itself in your life and how you realize that you had it and what you did to kind of not combat it. Right. Because it doesn't right. necessarily ever go away. Um, but what that looks like now in your life, like, I mean, you you want to start. Uh, yeah. The only disclaimer I want to put on it before. Uh, and 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 please. It, yeah, PTSD is not only just associated with veterans. No, so I know. I just want to put because people that always hear PTSD, they always think veterans. Of Anybody can suffer from it. Yes. It is it is so different from person to person. And honestly, we don't even have to call it PTSD. We can just call it PTS because it's just post traumatic stress. Like it doesn't necessarily have to have a disorder or a label. You're dealing with change, so, right? Yeah. Dealing with change um, or dealing with an with an event that had so much of event. an impact on you um, that it has now you know impacted yeah. your life like and there's not one more and and there's not one more extreme measure that can justify the term ptsd and what like even duncan talked about that too like i didn't do as much as the people before me so Mm -hmm. i didn't feel like i had this that's a problem with it a lot too like well i don't have this because i didn't fight in world war ii like i didn't invade germany right you know um so that keeps people away from getting the help they need yeah but yeah go i mean you go ahead duncan with your your side of it and yeah um so you mentioned like earlier about while you're over there, the adrenaline pumping, mm-hmm. oh, that's not necessarily the case, but a good analogy. So like, I, I'm guessing you guys had the same thing. When we came back from Iraq, we went kind of through like an, like an offboarding process, yeah. right? And it was really maybe two or three days. And one of the parts is we all sat in there and we listened to some, I think he was a colonel or a lieutenant colonel, talk to us about PTSD. And we went through TBI. I don't mm-hmm. know if you did that, but the shakes oh, together. Kuwait. Did you guys do it in same Kuwait? We did, we did it on our, once we were back uh, in Fort Drum. Oh, we so did we it in Camp, Camp Arishon. We did it in uh, oh, okay. Kuwait when we came back. Yeah. So ours, we were back at Fort Drum, um, which was nice. We were technically home, but we had a few things to do before we could go back on leave. So yeah. um, he talked to us. He said, you guys are like Jack in the Boxes. You, you've been living your life for the last year, um, coiled, like a coiled spring and then something happens and you pop open. Right. Uh, and I, I was like, okay, cool, bro. Like whatever. Again, how old are you at this point? Uh, I was 24 or five right? or four. How old were you when you came back? 25, 26. Right. Again, still not even like a fully capable adult, but yeah, yeah. you're still still capable of going through some pretty heavy shit. Yeah. So you kind of listen to him. You're like, all right, cool. You're um, like, bro, I'm just trying to get out of this. I'm just sitting through yeah. this so like I can get so I just want to go home. I like, I drink. Go home. Yeah. like we wanted to go drink. I hadn't drank yeah, any I beer. I want to see if I still know how to do it. Duncan probably wanted a cigarette, you know. No, I like, <laughs> actually actually the funniest part about oh, it. It's funny because um, I'm pretty sure you had some nicotine right oh, here yeah, on the I table, still, which is funny because he uses I love he used no, to use those too. I quit him now. That's good. Um, you quit him? Good, man. I, I switched Fist when bump. I was just kind of go I smoked and then I went to Afghanistan and then I got into Copenhagen and then I loved my Copenhagen and then I switched to the men's. Yes, I so um, I'll talk to you about those off air afterwards, and I'll okay. tell you why I quit them. Okay. Um, it's not for public Hashtag drugs. It's yeah. not for public <laughs> consumption. <laughs> um, no, but so I actually quit smoking cigarettes while I was deployed to Iraq. Well, that's what I was gonna say, which is like the funniest oh, wow. thing to me. Like I was so ju- cheap over there too, man. Oh, yeah, but it wasn't <laughs> that. It was just like I had a bet with someone on my truck, and uh-huh. and I went. We, I, he went for three months before he smoked, and he's like, dude, I lost. I, I smoked a cigarette. And I was like, well, I'll take my money, and then I won't buy cigarettes with it because I've already been three months. Yeah. So that's, that's— And you just quit cold turkey? Yeah. Yeah. Which was funny to me, though, because it's like that's kind of honestly one of the reasons why I joined. <laughs> to, my freedom to smoke <laughs> cigarettes, and then I quit in the most stressful environment I've yeah. ever been in in my life. No big deal. Um, yeah, but so when I got back, he talked to us a little bit about— um, kind of the jack-in-the-box thing like I was explaining, and— 
in one ear, out the other, went, did all the testing. Everything was fine uh, for TBI and stuff what like that. What kind of testing? So you do traumatic brain injury. There's right. actually like a test. Um, I don't remember it very well. Yeah. Which bad memory is one of which the side effects TBI, of PTSD. So. Or PTSD, <laughs> apparently, yeah. can, can impact your memory. Um, but we, uh, so we did the testing. And I think a lot of it was really straightforward, like matching shapes. Okay. You do like a click one too, and like you have to answer really fast or something like that. Yeah. Like do you see the dot or something? There's something yeah. about like how your brain connects to seeing things and how yeah. fast you can like react reaction to it. Time. If you, yeah. They're all bullshit. Yeah. They're just yeah. trying to say we do it. We, <laughs> if, we test them. If you good. don't have TBI, you're going to get hundred percent on this test. Okay. Right. Like yeah. it's nothing, it's not challenging. It's literally almost like reflexes, cognitive ability to look at a shape and be like, that's a shape. Click. Right. Like it's traumatic brain injury and CTE, um, which are pretty much mm-hmm. the same now. So, but, but back then they were probably just calling it a traumatic brain injury or TBI. Yeah. 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 And so that, that was that I did find, um, and then I booked my flights to go home, hopped on a plane, and I flew from um, New York, uh, I believe it was Syracuse, New York, to O'Hare. And then I switched flights from O'Hare to San Diego. And we were the last plane to take off out of O'Hare before the storm shut down the whole place. And oh, wow. it was the bumpiest takeoff I've ever been in my life. And I've flown. Like, I grew up in England. I flew yeah. all the time. I mean, i just flown from Iraq, straight from Al-Assad Air Base, like, back to New in, York. In, like, a or, military airplane, too? No, it was a charter jet. Oh, okay. So it's, like, an airline no one's ever heard of. <laughs> Even safer. <laughs> Full of military personnel, so you know it's not that big of a deal yeah. if it goes down, yeah. except, for the, <laughs> except for the flight attendants. Yeah. Um, and that didn't bother me. But when we took off out of O'Hare and we hit turbulence, my jack-in-the-box happened what exactly what he was talking about something happened that was unexpected like a trigger and i like i from that from that flight forward till about six months ago so we're talking almost 10 years yeah maybe more than 10 years yeah i hated flying mm. with a passion wow and it's because every time turbulence hit the jack-in-the-box came out so that's when i first started seeing something that yeah. was different and i had a less than pleasant experience when i was deployed in a helicopter um, they fly a little differently. They don't. Yeah, they're different. not. I, they I, cut through the air, but this one just went. Whoosh. Yeah, you avoid you avoid helicopters when you're over there. especially yeah. Chinooks because yeah. they <laughs> double the rotors, double yeah. the problems. Yeah. Um, so that was my first experience. Is like I remember thinking to myself, "What is that? This is the Jack in the Box that he's talking yeah. about." Because mm-hmm. a situation happened, I'm ready to react, and I have adrenaline like pumping through and my like, body. There's nothing for me to do except sit here. Exactly. Yeah. So that got, to the anxiety. Yeah, that got better. <laughs> over time with more exposure to flying, just kept doing it and doing yeah. it and doing it. Um, and then that kind of jack-in-the-box thing sort of slowly moved from flying into just everyday life. Right. Uh, loud noises are a pretty big giveaway. Like, you know, we were walking through a mall and, like, one of those, like, uh, A-frame type, uh, like, signs advertisement or, signs yeah. fell over. It's loud. Yeah. And that's yeah. still there to this day. Yeah. It's, it's minimized, but that kind of stuff as well. Um, but yeah, coming back, that was my first introduction to, oh, okay, this isn't going to be quite the same as it was before I left. Yeah. And then getting home and meet, like seeing all my friends and they're just like, oh, hey, where have you been? That kind of, yeah. that kind of thing. Like they don't care. Not that they're bad people. They just, oh, you were, you were, you know, work for a year. That's right. kind of how it feels. They don't yeah. realize like what the nature of the work was. And, and then you always get the question, um, uh, did you kill anybody? And you're like. I told somebody once, I said, you know, actually it was my boss at work asked me if I killed anybody. Your boss? Yeah. It's freaking inappropriate. You're like, bro, come on. I did, it was, no, it was, I'm it was, calling it was a woman. She was a great, excellent boss, actually. Oh, she was nice. one of my favorite bosses. And she just asked. And I told her, I said, you know, um, there was someone overseas, and I kept it real vague. It wasn't me. Um, was in a firefight, and we had uh, Bradleys. We didn't, our unit didn't have Bradleys, but scouts use Bradleys. Um, and it has a 25 millimeter cannon on it. So you're talking like the end of this microphone, that's as big as the bullet is that comes out of it. Oh, wow. Um, and a, like a young girl ran across the street and he hit her. And there's nothing left afterwards, right? Yeah. That dude never went out of the wire again. They never went out of the base again on mission. And he's, he still did his part. He did his job, but he never went on mission Can't again. Even imagine. So I told her that story and I said, imagine if that guy was me and you just asked me if I killed anybody. You're going to bring all of that right back. So that was kind of like the so thing. So think about that yeah. before you ask somebody yeah. that question next time. And then also I was like, also, how's my review for this year? <laughs> <laughs> so we went for that way. annual raise yeah. or what's going on? But, well, and it's yeah. funny because Jordan, it's not funny, haha, but funny, ironic. Jordan Peterson always says, which I know you got you guys both like him, right? You've listened yeah, to somewhat, him. Somewhat, you know. Yeah, whatever. I love yeah. J. Pete's. Me too. Yeah, yeah. 
Homie for life. So is this yeah. kid. Um, we can get into why he doesn't later. We he like says super, so. that post-traumatic stress is not necessarily always caused by something that you experienced, or but it more of something that you did. So it's like it's hard for you to stop reliving that stress or to completely eliminate that stress because it's from something that you actually did. So it's like, oh, shit. Like anything that I think about in my life that's that's reoccurring and definitely not to the level that you guys are at. But anything that still bothers me to this day or anything that I haven't like um, rectified is like because of something that I did, something wrong that I did. Can, can I interject for a minute? Sure. You, you said something that Ian and I hear all the time. Rectified? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I was gonna, if he hears it, he lives a very different life than yeah. I do. But yeah. no, um, no. You you mentioned not to the level that you guys have, right? So one of the things that people always say is, "Oh, I have PTSD, not like yours, not from the military." Yeah. Like I was doing some research because there's a ton of different like methods and therapies out there, and For one sure. of the videos I was watching, and I don't even remember what method this was. It's new, and it's actually deals with left brain, right brain stuff. I forget the name. It was pretty interesting. You hold the paddles? That's what I did. I think it might be the one. I I I didn't do it. I just researched it. It's like ER... Yeah, e- ER, I did that. That's why okay. I did. And there's like a color one they do. Yeah, or, yeah. So one of the videos of this, one of the the um, the doctors that has done the research and stuff on this, she mentioned she's like people always have the stigmatism behind PTSD. She said you can be in fourth grade and go up to present in front of your class and have bad acne and someone can laugh at you and that can be enough to cause PTSD. Yeah. So I think like always thinking that you have to have seen a buddy get blown to pieces it has or to be super traumatic. You know, you were on the. 300th floor of the World Trade Center. I don't know how many floors it had. <laughs> yeah. But you know what I mean? Like, and you yes. survived barely. By, it doesn't yeah. need to be something yeah, like that for yeah. it to have huge implications. It doesn't have to be extreme. And I, I mentioned that because it doesn't just impact civilians. It impacts veterans where we think, like, I didn't do enough. I, exactly. didn't, I didn't earn the right to mm-hmm. have this, what we've almost dubbed, like, a badge of honor. Like, if you right. come back with PTSD, it's like you must have seen some shit. It's like, yeah. no, not necessarily. Right. Like, you don't, you, you could have just gotten, you could have been in the chow hall and a mortar dropped, you exactly. know, yeah. two clicks away and you still heard it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't take much. Okay. I'll, I'll strike that from my vocabulary. Do it. Right. Okay. My trauma is just as bad as you can also, um, can you also strike rectify, please? Yeah. <laughs> just, just come, just Absolutely like, not. Take that one out of there. Um, yeah. My experience, uh, similar, but my reactions were different. Right. And I think that's how it manifests itself outside of, uh, Somebody that's suffering from you know, PTSD is different for each person. And I think that's what also makes it kind of harder to, to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I wanted to drink and fight when I got back. I wanted conflict. I liked conflict. You know, I enjoyed that aspect of the military. Yeah. Like, I wasn't that person where shots happened or even being an MP when I was dealing with somebody that was belligerent. I, wasn't, I was the type of person like, I'm up. I'll go take care of this. Yeah. And I enjoyed that um, a lot. I got a little drum rush. You get this sense of power from it. I'm like, yay, testosterone. Yeah, yeah, 100%. <laughs> so by the time I'm getting back, like I'm not fitting in with normal society because I'm drunk all the time and trying to fight people. Yeah. You know, either physically or argumentatively. Right. You know, and then I'm like, why can't I function in society? You know, like, why does everyone in my job hate me? Yeah, why is everything so hard? And then I <laughs> Where did I leave that, that bottle of Jack? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So that started this really vicious, vicious cycle for me where I would constantly be in conflict with others and then be upset with myself or upset with the world internally why they hated me. So I would drink. Mm -hmm. And that cycle went on for, I got out in 2012 until the end of 2017. Yeah. And the only reason that cycle had to end is because I lost... I think it was seven jobs in one year. Yeah. And I was like 260 pounds. I went Damn, broke. 260? Yeah, I was big. All right. And uh, I was getting evicted from my apartment. I had no place to go. So yeah. I went to the VA. <laughs> like I was like. You're like, so, something's got to give. I got to do guys? something. And I went to the VA in South Dallas. I was like, hey, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not functioning even in the, the slightest of words. Like, yeah. you know, they're. And that's why I get back to like Jordan Peterson because he talks about addiction at one point and he just says, just make your bed. And he gives that story about some guy he grew up with. He doesn't just say that. Yeah, but I, just his analogy. I say give him another chance. I listened to that in 12 Rules him. of Life and then he used the example of some guy he grew up with and saying that he never like did the things he was supposed to do and eventually got addicted to drugs and alcohol and he right. kind of associated it's with that. It's a lot deeper and than And then that. he got addicted to pain pills. For sure. Jordan Peterson yeah. did. So he I was did. like, I wonder if he struck that from the record. So he kind of like, I don't oh. think he struck that from the record, but <laughs> well, I think his addic- what happened to him was a lot different, but that I digress. That's I think his knowledge on, on addiction was not 
great. You know, I think he makes some other good points, but I think he needed to dive a little bit deeper. Into well, that. and you know what? Uh, um, the universe I, is funny that way because yeah. someone's speaking on something that maybe they haven't experienced and then they experience it and they're like, wow, this is yeah. fucking torrential. And addicts, addiction is, a, is heavily associated with these this, this trauma. Right. 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 Um, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people that you find in today's society, I know it's big. Uh, we talk about the opioid crisis. Yes. Um, there's, you know, there's another one. We've got, we got a current opioid crisis going on that no one talks about. Everyone's popping Adderall and Vivance and now meths on a huge rise. Yeah. So. Everybody's uh, on speed. Exactly. Everybody's using speed all the time. Yeah, yeah. So that's the next thing when all these people are have horrible and they want to put that in the news. But that's going on right now. Um, I mean, that's going on right now. The opioid crisis, yeah. meaning like pharmaceutical companies are just allowed to create addicts yeah. under the guise of helping people. And now there's also the thing talking about like. Yeah, microdosing is cool and all this stuff. Okay, so drugs. Just a little uh, bit of heroin? Yeah, just a little <laughs> bit of acid. Just don't do a lot. Okay, first of all, calm down. It's psilocybin with mushrooms. Okay, but okay. So, but, which are but with, plants. But with somebody but. with trauma and you start associating drugs and alcohol, mm-hmm. they start to self medicate. It's a dangerous. Well, I don't road. even think that they have to associate drugs and alcohol. They they start self medicating with whatever. They people exactly. can self medicate with fucking supplements. Exactly. My mom does it. She goes well, to the freaking health food store every time something's wrong with her, and she has another pill. But you know, I don't. Yeah, but like, it's a lot different if I drink two fifths and start driving around my vehicle. Oh, I know. Then someone you know taking a bunch of vitamin C. You know, but so <laughs> like that's, that's, that's true. Right? You're right. You okay. Know? Or okay. or the effects of drugs and alcohol on that. So like that's why I kind of. You know, I digress in that a little bit. And I'd say, hey, let's take a step back and take a look at these things. Yeah. Um, I'm not like, let's not go back to the 50s and ban everything and just shame people for doing those things because some people could do it normally. Yeah. But if you have trauma, if you have PTSD or you have something uh, that is going on with you yeah. that is not fully dealt with yeah. and you start combining drugs and alcohol with that. Mind altering substances regardless gonna, of it's, yeah. It's mm-hmm. not going to end well. Right. Well, and that's like kind of what and you, you, you and and vast majority of them die. Right. Well, and that's like right? the difference between like uh, not the difference, but when I'm when my dad died, I was like, and I said it on the last episode too. I'm actually pretty proud of myself that I didn't get drunk or use drugs to numb the pain. Yeah. Right. I wanted to feel everything. You got I wanted to. to experience everything. I wanted to cry when I needed to cry. I wanted to be angry when I needed to be angry. And um, one of my friends gave me a gift is a grief journal where you talk about. Um, you know, like the experience and like how you mm-hmm. found out that they were going to die or the, how you felt when they died and all these things. And, and yeah. I think that if it's, but well, and another thing I wanted to say about, you know, you guys and people that serve in the military, whether it's men or women, but particularly men, I, and you guys are different, right? Like I feel like, and other people might be different too, but I feel like men are not encouraged to talk about their feelings ever. So not only do you carry yeah. that stigma of like having all of this trauma from the military or trauma from life, it doesn't necessarily have to be yeah. from the military because yeah. other men have trauma that they don't discuss. Um, and then you come home and then it's like, you're supposed to just assimilate and be married and be normal, right? Like you're just supposed to come back and then everything's just supposed to be fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're not going to, the government's not going to, you know, provide you with a therapist or any kind of alternative treatments or therapies for yeah. well, recovering from coming they back. Do. Well, yeah. I mean, maybe not when you I guys mean, came back. But yeah. When no, I came no. back, like it was, I, 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 I'm not a fan of the government just by nature of yeah. the way they, they behave, but I'm not going to knock them because they paid for my schooling. Right. Um, they did take into account the injuries well, that I received. They and didn't I, just be, pay for your schooling. You served the country to earn they, such There's a lot of benefits from Yeah, they don't right. drop yeah. you and just say, good luck. Like Vietnam vets would come back and like two days later they were out. Yeah. So there I go comparing my, my experience to theirs again. But right. I'm saying like they have, they have improved. Right. Yeah. I'm still not a fan in general of taxes and the government, but, yeah. um, they have improved a lot when it comes to taking care of veterans. Okay. And so, yeah, but you're right though, came back and I think the people around me, and I don't know if this was your experience, but I didn't want to push my problems onto other people. Right. They expected me just to come back and kind of like go about my business. Well, you're a man, you're supposed to man up, you're just supposed to own this shit and you're supposed to keep walking and yeah. everything's just supposed to be. Well, he said it too. And like, I, you know, uh, cause he went through it and, I, and it's almost can become, if there's a next war, it's our responsibility, but uh, mine was a Vietnam vet. 
that help me. You know, it's usually like the Vietnam vets uh, that kind of go through. It sounds like one talked to you about it, and why, mine was a Vietnam vet that actually walked me through the the. He was actually a doctor that did the trauma therapy and so forth. Um, but the truth of the matter is, like, if you're if you're experiencing any kind of issues from mm-hmm. your past and they're affecting the way in the future you want to go to, like yeah. you can be experiencing some kind of trauma, whatever the case may be. Yeah. And what he's speaking about in terms of the government, like the government's slow. It's a slow moving ship. It doesn't, sure. it doesn't react well to things. Not efficient. Um, society, we don't react well to things. Like when PTSD was first talked about, uh, I got out in 2012, it was a lot harder for me to get a job as a veteran. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I'm a crazy veteran. Exactly. Yeah, you know, like yeah. you can't, you can't hire a veteran. Granted, you were drinking and fighting all the time. Well, yeah. this, this is before <laughs> they knew that. And you have red hair. But yeah. This is before he they is knew that. He is a soulless that. ginger, yeah. let's be real. This is before, this is before that they would experience that once they hired me and then they were like, oh, we're right. We can't hire veterans. So I, Shit, so this guy's nuts. I probably took away some uh, hiring opportunities for veterans by acting like that. But like, <laughs> I did. Oh, you did But, uh, <laughs> You know, it, it took a lot of time and you talk about still today, like still today I have to, you know, learn to deal with those sort of things. You know, like I, I apply a lot of, you know, I got meditation in my life, like next to my bed is the the Ryan Holiday uh, daily stoic quotes, like the daily kind of – yeah, you know, just a – Well, and you yeah. and I have had these conversations too. You like to uh, – you – when we first met, you were really into like secular Buddhism, and still, yeah. I, I was going to say, I feel like that's yeah. still something that you're definitely interested in, and you're still into. And yeah, I'm interested in the, uh, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Jordan Peterson, like Sam Harris does a great job. He's got some weird ideas, but he, yeah. when it comes to mindfulness and neurology, he's done a lot of work. Yeah, and like I like when they debate; it's like my favorite. Yeah, that stuff applies a lot to you know uh, anybody with any kind of trauma or mm-hmm. like the number one way they treat dis- uh, eating disorders now is is mindfulness yeah. practices. Yep. Um, so it doesn't have to necessarily be like a, a religious aspect of it, but yeah. there is a lot of value in that. Yeah. Um, and to kind of bringing yourself back into reality a little bit. Because um, the biggest thing for me, and I, I don't want to speak for Duncan, but I think a lot of it is what it takes to start getting help um, is, is this is something happens where you're humiliated to the point that you, you know, your, your ego sets down a little bit and then you go, shit, man, something ain't right. Like when you hit rock bottom yeah. and you're like, I literally have nothing else. What the uh, fuck am I doing? Rock bottom is a tough word because I don't, again, that's also, a, you, you can't have PTSD unless you're in the military. Well, I can't have a rock bottom unless I'm like sleeping under a bridge, you know, like, cause that's Well, I mean, everybody. you lost your apartment and you got fired seven times. I've For me, it was say different. That says but rock bottom. I'm speaking, yeah. I'm speaking. <laughs> no, I still had some downward potential. No, I, mean, yeah, I did. I, saw, I had some, I had some rings on that ladder to drop. Trust me. Trust me. I could have gone in a different. Okay, that's but, true. <laughs> it's also I'm saying that for anybody listening that might be suffering they're like oh you know I keep my job I didn't I didn't I didn't I assimilate know. nicely nothing's wrong with me I'm none fine. of that happened yeah. to me I'm not I'm yeah. not that Ian guy out there getting drunk and fighting people getting Fucking fired from Ian jobs guy. you know like that's not what's happening to me but it doesn't mean you're not suffering from something that True. in your past that True. yeah is, is I always say this if if there's something in your past that continuously getting in the way and the person you want to be now and in the future, and it's been happening over a long period of time, yeah. something's wrong. You should address it. You yeah, because you're not getting to where you want to be. Right. Why aren't you constantly not getting – it's not society. True. You know, there could be things, things that happen in your life that bring you down, whatever, that we all deal with that. It's called adversity. You yeah. know, we have to overcome it. But if you're going on a couple years, three years, and you keep trying the same thing over and over again, yeah. and something's holding you back – you, you might want to go talk to a might professional. Might want to look in the you, mirror and then figure you, it you out. You don't have to be, you know, chugging fifths of alcohol, you know, and uh, losing your jobs and, you know, going to uh, hospitals to get help. Like you don't, that doesn't have to happen. Um, for there to be real trauma, to be, to be unresolved real, trauma. Or, the, problems. or for the symptoms of your trauma to be real, right? Like yeah. you don't have to get to where Ian was at or even where I was at because like, I mean, we haven't talked about it much, but like my PTSD led to a divorce, yeah. uh, which, uh, oh, I didn't want, I, do, I wanted to make sure that both of you knew that anything you don't want to talk about is not, you don't have to. No, so yeah. I, didn't, I didn't want to bring it up, but oh, yeah, you're no, more than yeah. allowed to. For no, sure. I'm, I'm an open book about it. And I yeah. think that's one of the big things is like, I talk to people in my workplace. Um, when I was, I mean, I'm not like actively out there dating anymore, obviously, because I met someone, but um, when I was actively dating, I would tell them before we met, like, I have PTSD. 
not the Ian kind, right? If not, <laughs> and I would tell them, I'd be like, not the violent kind, because that's the first thing they think of. Yeah. Military personnel, PTSD, they're mm. going to throw me off a balcony. Yeah. Like, every that's time. That's the, really? They that's, think it's violent. Not yeah. necessarily the balcony, but yeah, they think it's violent. I would wow. only fight assholes, though. See, so when, I hear that stuff, <laughs> when I hear that stuff, I immediately turn into the therapist, and I'm like, so how does that make you feel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like, for that to be the case, though, is a lot of people, like, mine doesn't, didn't manifest the same way that his yeah, did. Yeah, it doesn't. Right. And it, I don't know if yours, like, mine, like, was pretty okay for the first, like, like eight years I was back from Iraq. Like I didn't like flying, so mm-hmm. I didn't fly as much. Right. Or, or I would like take a Xanax and fly right. or drink and fly. Right. Um, but I was I was not using substances. Like I on the outside, I looked successful. I got my bachelor's degree. I got into a good job. I became mm-hmm. a manager at the company I was working at very quickly. Like I was successful uh, in the professional environment. So society, societally, you looked normal. Right. Yeah. Um, however, the problem was internal for mm-hmm. sure. Uh, depression and... Um, just a sense of what's the point? Complacency a little bit, like yeah, just checking yeah, the box every day, like whatever. Um, but the the problem that I had is I felt like I volunteered to go to war. I like when I signed up. I know I joked about the cigarette thing, but I did want to see what the Band of Brothers mm-hmm. was really like. Like I didn't want to join and go into the Air Force and stay here in the U.S. or join in the Army and do something that I could do in the civilian life. Right. Know? Like I wanted to join in a combat arms role and I wanted to go to war. So. Um, I did that, but then I felt like I signed up to do that knowingly, like during a time of conflict in our country, I signed up and said, I want to do a job that will put me on the front lines. Right. And that's why they were like, well, you can be infantry. And I was like, that sounds kind of boring. And they're like, what well, do you want to be a calf scout? And I was like, sure. Um, that was kind of the comment, like, cause I didn't want to be like vanilla infantry. Like if I could go yeah. back and do it again, I probably would have just joined the infantry cause they're fine. They're okay. Yeah. Um, they're fine too. They're cool. Don't they're tell, don't tell any of my calf scout buddies I ever <laughs> saw that because there's a rivalry. But so when I came back, I didn't want other people to know that there was anything wrong because I didn't feel like, you know, like you, for example, as a friend, like I don't want to dump my burdens on you. Like you, you don't get the thanks for being a veteran. You don't get the 20% discount at Noble or whatever. Yeah. Like when you're buying your CrossFit shoes, like you don't get that <laughs> shit. We get 20% there? Really? Oh. I think so. I know. I was about to say you should get them. So what's there, up? I just bought a pair. Huge fan. Did you get the okay. high tops or low tops? Low tops because it's not the 80s. Are you ever embarrassed to do that? Like if you go to some place and like they're like, ask oh, we do a veteran discount. discount. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I never, I never yeah. ask for it because I, I don't know, have an yeah. ID and I don't just like carry my DD-214 well, in my pocket. It, I have, uh, yeah, but oh. you can get it. They never, but in Texas you can get veteran on your license. Oh. Yeah, it says, mm. it, yeah, mine says it on my license. Now you like Texas again. You just have to go. <laughs> yeah, you just not have, really. America. Yeah, you just have to go to the, uh, DMV and show them your D214 that put on your license. Oh, okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so that was my problem. Is like I had a pretty normal Get you out of tickets. looking sometimes. Smart. Never had a speeding ticket. Whatever. Shut the. F- <laughs> don't say that out loud. You're I gonna get it, one now that you leave. I say it all the time. Driving your dad mobile now. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're not got, driving the Audi anymore. Got rid of the Audi. Yeah. yeah. Got responsible. So yeah, that mindset of not being able to like push that trauma or problem on someone else. You're like, yeah. I'm gonna deal with it myself, or I'll talk to a professional. But I'm not drinking a fifth of alcohol and getting in fights all the time, or yeah. right. I'm not living under a bridge like the but Vietnam vets. But did you personally talk to a professional? Did either of you do yeah, that? Yeah, I did. I did. I have a friend who will remain um, nameless. Yeah. And they have their PhD in psychology. Got it. Uh, so, and, but you did. You so made an effort I to talk to someone. I talked with them a okay. lot. Got it. Um, and they were also a, a veteran from the Marines. Great. Iraq, mm-hmm. Afghanistan. So I have a professional that I talk to in a non-professional Got environment. It. And then I also, one of the things we didn't really touch on is like, I have my uh, primary care physician. He had, when he was going through residency, his best friend who was also going through residency did uh, a lot of work with PTSD. Mm-hmm. So I work with him on the on the chemical front. Right. And then I worked with my other friend on the more emotional, emotional psychological front. Yeah. See, but that's, that's like really impressive and that's why I was saying you guys are different than say someone in like my dad's generation because my dad really struggled and I think that what people don't understand is like he was my, I mean my dad was a baby right he was signed up when he was 17 went in when he was 18 served the four years overseas and granted he wasn't in like a war or whatever but again that doesn't really matter um, but everything played out in different ways like he never he wouldn't talk about his feelings he didn't talk about like anything that he went through and then eventually that did lead to a divorce and you know some serious like drug and dependency issues mm-hmm. and a couple of stays in uh the psych ward and yeah, there I've was been there. so many things i got meatloaf though so if you're ever 
No. Which word? <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit hungry and a little bit crazy. Yeah, America. Yeah, you wanna, <laughs> a lot but of can vacation. you get your uh, 20% discount? Yeah, yeah. I um, don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> but yeah, so he, he dealt with a lot of um, like the substance abuse yeah, and all of that stuff. But common. also he came from a different generation where, I mean, I commend both of you as, and this sounds, I, I'm not trying to sound sexist because as women, we process our issues by talking about them, right? Mm-hmm. Like we are way more prone to talk about our problems than men typically yeah. societally are encouraged to talk about their problems. Men will eventually, like for my, I can't speak for all men, but my experience is when it, when it, finally started to me and actually I want to go back to a point that Duncan made really well, especially people with PTSD. We, we, we will we'll do a really good job of making the rest of the world think our life's okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. and up until that point in 2017, I started losing my job and so forth. Well, I, I got out in 2012. So there was, there was a long period of time where I was having a very successful career. Right. I was making six figures a year, Looking normal. really nice apartment. Yeah. But um, we're really good at doing that to make sure the rest of the world knows we're okay until shit hits the fan. Right. You know. But on and the inside, you're like. Mine was the, the craziness of losing a bunch of jobs. Duncan's was, it sounds like a divorce. Like there's something, eventually a catalyst happens, and eventually breaks. And that's when you can't hide it anymore. Yeah. Because exactly. yeah, yeah. like everything was like, and that's yeah. the thing like my parents said to me, they're like, we thought everything was fine. And I was like, no, I told you like things were rough, you know. Yeah. And it wasn't. Yeah, I, and at the They're time, like, but wait, but work's going good, and you have a house, and you have a wife, you just, and two yeah. kids. Like, what? What do yeah, you mean? You're, that's, yeah. wrong. that's what you're supposed to do. You right. got it going on, you know. Yeah, and then I think that when it when it broke, um, that was when like my my dad's a veteran too, um, and his father was in World War II. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then on my mom's side, um, her father was a conscientious objector for religious reasons, oh, wow. but he was a farmer during World War II in okay. England. Nice, uh, and then also was in the fire brigade. So, and London. During the Blitz, right. you might as well have been in the trenches in World War One. It yeah, was brutal exactly. and yeah. brutal. Pretty much yeah. anyway, yeah. So all of them had it, and they all dealt in different ways. So like when I had it, my dad and my mom like reached out to a friend that was shot in the neck during Vietnam, and mm-hmm. he had a real rough time of it with PTSD and stuff. So they started researching and doing a lot of stuff, which was really helpful. That is helpful. But if I'd have been more open about it about seven years earlier, yeah, yeah. like we could have mitigated some damage. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. That's how it always, I feel like that's the problem and that's how it always is. The problem is some people that are suffering, you know, luckily I, you know, I, you know, I got treatment, I got help, um, you know, sober for the most part, had little slips here and there. I can't drink alcohol. I still don't do that because it still causes those issues. Uh, But some people like, you know, suicides are high for some reason. Like that's why they're high. I know. You know, some mm-hmm. people, that is their breaking moment yeah. when they take their own life. Yeah. Like, that's the moment where everybody's like, oh, I didn't know anything was wrong with them. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And that's why it's, you know, what Duncan was talking about is like, I should have done something about it earlier. Well, luckily for us, ours wasn't that. Right. Do you know? And there mm-hmm. was a point in that 2017, I didn't have any guns in my house. Like, there's a reason why they were On weren't. purpose. On yeah. purpose. Like, they couldn't be there because I had no idea what I was going to do. Mm-hmm. And I, I got to the point where I would drink three days straight. Like I just wouldn't stop. Mm-hmm. And, I, and then in that state, like I had no, I know what's going to happen. No. Right. So that's a big thing that to bring up. So like if people are suffering from these things or you have an issue, like you have the inclination going back in your head, like mm, something ain't right. And you're trying to power through it. Like, good luck, you know, go get help. Like, yeah. and it doesn't have to be a man or a woman or right. whatever. It's, it's your, your pride and your ego is so high in your way and your life's going to shit. And, like, and I mean, you're also you don't need to do that. concerned about like public perception, right? Like what are people going to think about me or what, you know, whatever the case may be, yeah. maybe not like your friends, but like, oh, well, I are think, people going to think I'm crazy? Yeah. To a therapist oh, they knew or, I was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they didn't. I think for me, um, it's like I was too far yeah. gone. Yeah, they, knew what, they knew what was up. They liked me. I, I mean, nice, I've known but... you for like an hour and I'm, I don't doubt that, yeah. right? Yeah, you're, you're on point with that diagnosis. You came, you started just like, yeah, hey, you look he like a hat off. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. ginger. I look like Colonel Winters and now you're like, I don't really, it doesn't act like Colonel Winters, man. Colonel Winters was a Quaker. Um, yeah, but for that, where you're saying about, I've actually one of the like the big breakthroughs that I've had like is I don't care if people think I'm weird, mm. like or crazy. When was this? When did that happen? I uh, after the divorce, uh, probably because I went through a lot of turmoil. Like, and I I don't know if your experience was the same, but PTSD can bring the worst or the best out in other people when they're trying to help you. Mm. Um, if there's anything that drives me crazy, it's like, oh, you have PTSD and mine manifests like it started off more depression mm-hmm. and 
up to last year, very bad anxiety to the oh, point yeah. where last year, like I remember being like on the phone with my with my mother, being like, if I didn't have two kids, like, I would blow my brains out. Yeah, like I, it was that bad. Yeah. But I decided I was like mission oriented. I have two kids. I provide for those children. Um, I love them and I never want them to think they're responsible for what happened to me. Yes. So it's not going to happen. Right. Yeah. And I just made that call. I made that decision. And I do, I mean, I do own two firearms, but I was just like, no. No. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. I, That's for, my hard stuff. For, for yeah. a yeah. long time, I had, you know, when I knew it could close to the end, like the the last, and this is it's a horrible way to live, but the last thought before I went to sleep every night is I should kill myself. And the first thought I had in the morning when I woke up is I should kill myself. Jesus. Every night for imagine. years, mm-hmm. you know, years going through that, going, oh, that's normal. You know, like, <laughs> you know, my life's good. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're, that that comes up in your head, man, you should do something. Yes. Like, you should do something now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and you can you can get back to some resemblance of life. Like, we're all weird. We're all different. We're all of human. Course. You know, yeah. the people that, like, you know, project that their lives are perfect, like, they're, they're more fucked up than what you think, you know, but... But that's that's the big scary part right there. You know, mm-hmm. like you're not dealing with something that is a headache. You're dealing with something, you're dealing with a very deadly mental illness that you need to go get help for immediately or it's it's going to end badly. Yeah. You know? And I think it's scary. Like the first time that thought pops into your head, it scares you. Yeah. Because, you know, some people... Um, well, you wouldn't even miss me if I killed myself, right? Yeah. No. It's not like that. It's like you're inside your own head mm-hmm. listening to yourself talk about killing yourself. Yeah. yeah. Planning, thinking. And, and you're not. Yeah. yeah. You're you're like, well, well, calm down, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah. Hold up. Hold up. Where are we going? <laughs> but, but dude's not calming down. <laughs> yeah. You know? It's two conversations it's going really on. It's really weird. Yeah. Yeah. And it's terrifying because you sit down afterwards and you're like, I literally just planned out how to kill myself. Yeah. Right? Um, I didn't get quite to that point because I was just like, I kept, I, I my other voice, I guess you would say, man, I, we the really angel do sound and crazy the devil. now. Yeah, yeah. For sure. But the angel voice was definitely like two kids. And yeah. then that would shut down the conversation every time. Right. Nice. Um, which was good. But the other thing I was going to point out, like we mentioned, like as far as getting help, talking about it, yeah. like I texted one of my buddies last night who's a veteran. I went through basic training with him um, and he just posted some kind of stuff where the yeah. last few days yeah. he was yeah. more yeah. active on social media. And I, I was like, I'm going to reach out to him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I reached out to him. He'd recently moved across the country. His girl just left him. And so I was like, dude, I was like, I've got extra points on my card. Like, if you want to come down here. And he's like, I appreciate it. And that kind of thing, right? He's not, you know, chugging a gallon of vodka. He's not sitting in his room thinking about ending it. Like, right. he's just heartbroken. Yeah. Yeah. And knowing that that community is out there, I think was really helpful. And I told him, I was like, dude, if you ever want to come down here, like, come down. We'll, we'll go out. We'll have fun. Yeah. So you don't, I think a lot of people are like, I have PTSD. I need to quit drinking, go to AA. It's not the same for everybody. Right. right. And to the plan me, of action yeah, is not like, the same. No. I still go out. Like I'm going out to um, is it the Rough Riders baseball team? Yeah, I went, uh, went there oh. a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I'm going it's there blast. tonight. It's oh, blast. I don't have some. You're you know, already in the area. You should just hang out here. Yeah, all my day. girlfriend yeah. lives in Plano. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't uh, know that. Okay. So um, we took the we took you know or a little your girl, a little stepdaughter, girl. Yeah. Yeah, her stepdaughter. Yeah, stepdaughter. Yeah, pretty much. I guess you know. I don't know. It's kind of hard to describe because we're not married yet. But my girlfriend's daughter that I live with and you know, care for. So, and then like another 10 year old, <laughs> you can sort but, of like, say you take, stepdaughter, I think. I think we're good. Yeah. It's but not a you, formal uh, podcast. When you take uh, two little girls to a baseball game, man, they're like, dude, they don't, don't want to watch much baseball. You know, they're 10. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm like, like, I'm like one of those little girls. I just, I drink warm beer and eat cold hot dogs. Yeah, that's all I do. The hot dogs are pretty good. This man. is fun. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm going out to do that tonight and I was, I'm able to get to that point, but all of last year, uh, probably about eight months, I didn't want to go out. I didn't want to do anything because I was terrified of having a panic attack. I yeah. was, and it was that same jack-in-the-box mentality had uh, bled over from flying only to just life in general. So yeah. I would get like a twinge or a pain or something, and I'm like, I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. To the point where like my mom used to be a nurse, and she came out. I'm a 35-year-old dude. or No, I was 34 at the time because it was before my birthday. But I'm 34 years old, successful, doing fine financially, like – my boss thinks I'm crushing it. Everything's great. And then I, I call my mother and say, can you come stay with me? You're like, mom, I have crippling anxiety. Yeah. I can't <laughs> leave this so house. She came out and I kept saying like the anxiety has physical things. So I felt like there was a hot yeah. stake just 100%. pushed through my chest. Yeah. Yes. And I'm like, there's something wrong with my heart. And my mom's like, that's not your heart. That's not where your heart is. <laughs> yeah. And then I stopped her. I was like, don't tell me where it is then. Yeah. Because then I'll start having pains there because yeah. that's just how it works. Yes. Yeah. So 
I had to, I went through, and this is the other thing that just drives me crazy. I, I did reach out and talk to a psychiatrist. Worst experience of my life. I know. Uh, yeah. Not because she was a bad psychiatrist, but because she had, she was so overworked, so many patients. Yeah. Right. Um, so she just, I could tell by the way that she was prescribing stuff. Um, the first thing that she sp- prescribed me was there was like a daily pill that I took yeah. uh, that works great for some people. It's very low risk. So they always start you there. Yeah. Of course. Did nothing for me. Yeah. Right. And then when I was having like an in-the-moment panic attack, sometimes they'll provide you with like Xanax or Klonopins yeah. or something. They gave me an antihistamine, which is like a Benadryl. Yeah. And it, all it did, it was the most terrifying experience. I was having a panic attack and I took a couple of them because that's what I was supposed to take two if I was having one. Yeah. It basically made me so tired I couldn't move. I know. Paralyzed me. Yeah. So the you're like, fear and the anxiety was just like, ooh. Still yeah. There. My, yeah. Running rampant. Yeah. So I kind of went through that whole process. And then I stopped talking to her and I went back to my doctor. And I said, look, you put me on Prozac first. I didn't like that. And some people love it. And it works yeah. great for them. It sure. didn't, didn't work well for me. It's like the standard. Yeah. That's where they start. Yeah. 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 And then he put me on something called Trintilex. And that didn't work for me because I couldn't sleep on it. Then I went to this other one, which was Buspirone or something like that. That didn't work for me. I still had anxiety. Yeah. Finally, put me on a different something that he said is his favorite, but once you're on it, you need to stay on it because there are bad withdrawals. Okay. Um, So that's what I take now, and every morning, take 100 milligrams of, uh, it's called like Pristique or Desvenlafaxine or something, and that works great for me. I have no side effects or anything. However... Every person's journey is different, 100%. and it took me a year. Well, actually, even when I first met you back in the day, that was when I was on Prozac. Yeah. So it's taken me two or three years to get to a point of having something, because I do have a chemical imbalance, right? Like, it's there. Yeah. Um, having something in my life that actually, like, helps and then brought me to a point where it's like, now I work out every day. The gym is is therapy for me, yeah. um, and I talk to people about my my issues. Like my friends, like no, they check in on me. Like yeah. uh, built a community, that kind of stuff around myself. But it took such a long time. It's a process, yeah. That's a huge. I mean, like I'm an economics major. We talk about barriers to entry. Oh, I'm an economics major too. Oh, yeah. I graduated uh, yeah. 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 What it, What do you do? No, wait, sorry. <laughs> Get out of here with your life. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. So like barriers to entry. Like that's a huge barrier to entry for yeah. people getting help. Is you call up and say, I need to speak to a therapist. Sure, your wait time is about six years. Yeah. Right? Like, there's nothing yeah, there. Luck. The well, best thing you can do is, like, what are you going to go to the ER if you want to talk to somebody immediately? No. Yeah. That's not. Then you get to go stay in one of those they fancy cycles. 30 seconds in the ER, yeah. If you're in there too yeah. long. 30 uh, seconds in the ER and a meatloaf. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's where they'll put you. That's what puts you in the cycle. America. Or, here's your meatloaf <laughs> and here's your locked door, man. Um, yeah, it's true. And, and the other hard part about it is, too, and I don't want to discourage people, like, everybody's. Like, I don't know, not necessarily cure is the way to put it, is different. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Duncan Duncan can consume alcohol and takes medication. I, I, I don't take medication, but I can't consume alcohol. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I was going to say, yeah. if, you, you know? if you felt comfortable, like, talking about that process and, the so, like, being sober and, mm-hmm. and proclaiming that you're sober and saying it out loud. Yeah, you sober know, with slips is what I've called in the past, so I'm not going to come, Well, you you're know, not like, perfect and nobody's perfect, yeah, yeah. so... I mean, not everybody's. I mean, some people have the ability to be sober for you know six, seven, eight, I've nine, ten years. The majority of the past since 2017, since I went into and when I went to the VA, I went to rehab there, right in South Dallas uh, during Christmas and so forth. For the most part, there's been there's been uh, slips like for maybe for a weekend or a week, but for the most part, I've been sober. Right, and every time I do, it, it comes back. Like there's you know like again, there's no cure for me. Like right. I'm gonna mm-hmm. get back into that stage where. I want some adventure and I want some fun and I want or some conflict. Or you want to go off, off, and off I'm, path. Yeah, and then I'm in Oklahoma or something like that, you know, starting shit. You know, so, shit. That's like, where you end up? I don't shit. know. You need to stop <laughs> drinking forever. Yeah. <laughs> Find a better state to end up. Putting yeah. shit on my Instagram story at 3 a.m. Yeah, 3 a.m. And then your yeah, friends have right. to tell you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, that they're worried about you. Yeah, so those. that's why, that's my, part of my, you know, Well, and it's kind of similar it, you know, to like, what Duncan said is like, you know, he's like, I go to the gym now. I know I have to take medication. I know I have to check in with myself on yeah. these things to ensure that I stay on the right path. Exactly. Which and is the same thing for, for you. It's every, just different steps. Yeah, everyone's yeah. suffering. And and I and I do a lot of, we talk about, you know, study like the, the Buddhism, Stoicism, yeah. those sort of meditations yeah. and, and the practical application of those throughout my day help a lot. Yep. You know, and I, I do those things because they're, they're kind of my prescription for them. You well, know? and so. I think that this took some self-exploration on both of your parts to try to find what mm-hmm. it is that worked for you to yeah. combat the side effects or the effects from PTSD. Yeah, you go to the doctor and you got a broken leg, they know what's up. 
Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. You, know, you, know, you go in there and go, right. hey, uh, you know, like you don't know how to really describe it, but yes. exactly. <laughs> and medical professionals will tell you we don't know a lot about it. Yeah. Right. Like it's it's kind of like you go in and you say like I have an infection. They don't. They're just going to throw pills at you until it goes away. Right. Yeah. Like that's kind of a little bit what they do with PTSD. Right. And it's not necessarily just pills, but they're going to throw at like try this, try this, try this, because it's different with everybody. Yeah. Like some people's PTSD manifests in anger, yep. some's mm-hmm. depression, some is manic behavior, which yep. I think kind of like the going out and fighting, you know, yeah. that yeah. kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, some is anxiety where they don't want to go out. They don't want to interact with yeah. anybody. They don't want to change their routine or change what they eat. Like all of that stuff is it. So they have to figure out and customize a solution for each person. Yeah. yeah. But I think the first part is just starting. And so like you said, you've encouraged people multiple times like that are listening. If you are having these issues, get help. Yeah. Yeah. I would encourage people, if you know people that are having these issues, yeah. go get, go talk to them. Like, if you've earned that right, like don't just walk up to some stranger. Some random. But if you've earned I that used to right, be a little messed up, man. Yeah. You know, like. want to talk about it? Yeah. <laughs> but once you've earned that right to be a person in their life that they'll talk to about these things, yeah. Offer to set up the appointment. Like offer to do yeah. all the legwork, mm-hmm. remove every barrier to entry for them getting in and actually getting help. Okay. Yeah. And that helps. Like my parents offered to do that for me. Like my dad made calls for me. And again, I'm 34, 35 at the time that this Still, is going yeah. on. Yeah. I needed it. Like I needed someone to come in and do those yeah. things for me. Um it's tough to deal yeah. with like bureaucracies of hospitals and VA when you're having mental health. Yeah. It's tough when you're not, but like, like when you're having right. mental health, it's hard to go deal with a medical bureaucracy, you know? Exactly. Like, and it'll push the anger out. Like yeah. for me, like I remember calling and leaving a very unpleasant <laughs> voicemail on the the therapists or the psychiatrists, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't her personal one, but it was like yeah. the voicemails place where you yeah. could leave one. And I like cussed him out. I was like super mad. And then I called back like 20 minutes later and I'm like, like, yeah, I did. But it's because they said they were going to call me at five o'clock, right? It's five o'clock. I called them. They're closed. And you're like, and I'm like, I've been waiting all day to talk to you so I can get something to help me. Cause I'm like, yeah, I, I, every morning I woke up and I said, this is going to be my life for the rest of my life. I don't really care if I get hit by a truck. Um, and they didn't. And then she called me like five 17 or something, which I was like, Ugh. like I felt bad, but I'm at the uh, same time, don't tell me you're going to call me at five when like everything uh, in my life is hinging on this phone call. Literally. So having someone else there that can kind of work through the bureaucracy um, and maybe set up more like in-person appointments. I was doing everything over the phone because yeah. of COVID. Um, but like in-person appointments, stuff like that, where you can really sit down and dig into stuff. Like yeah. that's, that was like almost being like the executive assistant for Someone your PTSD you friend. That's, well, that's, that's a, important. It's funny when you said that's such a military thing. Like you told me five o'clock <laughs> and it is not 445 <laughs> well, and you're I'm not calling, calling me. I'm calling in <laughs> with PTSD from my time in Iraq. 517. Like it's, if you're a therapist, you should yeah. know this by that's, now. I know I do the same thing. You're yeah, you're like, aren't you the professional a, or what? Like I got here 15 minutes early. Like I can't do it. Like, like, I'm, <laughs> I'm here early. I, I like, always I, get here early. I don't know what to do. And then I'm just like confused. I'm just sitting around. I was in my car. I'm like, it's eight minutes. <laughs> Am I civilian enough for you now? I'm like, Ian, I'm right around the corner. I'll yeah. be there in five seconds. I'm like hanging seconds. out in the car, man. I'm I like, will be there. Just looking around. Just right? I, I was like, my thought is like, I didn't want to get here too soon because I didn't want to be like some random dude in a neighborhood yeah. that nobody knows me and then they call call the cops on me or something. <laughs> like, that's the kind of thing. Like, I'm in an uncomfortable yeah. environment. Yeah. Yeah. Before that, like coming to this last year would have not happened right because of the ptsd and, I think, and anxiety and i think that that's that's another thing too is like having because i started texting you guys last year mm-hmm. about it yeah yeah and we talked about it and i think that the universe- oh we should have done that one i could have been drunk and he could have been having a panic attack that would have been, <laughs> that been a great <laughs> uh, if you brought your bottle so here's one of the interesting things why a lot of people with anxiety go to alcohol yeah. um i would i probably would have been like give me some of that yeah because alcohol and clonopins or cl- clonazepam they work on the same part of the brain which yeah. is why you can't drink and take them oh you say and i say you can't black mm-hmm. out <laughs> you shouldn't yeah i never i, I highly <laughs> advise against it yeah i never do because never. that's part of the anxiety is i'm pretty careful with yeah what i like whether I'm drinking, I'm a, I drink a lot of water at the same time, whatever yeah. the case is. But um, drinking like helps with anxiety, which is yeah. one of the reasons why if you have PTSD and you end up drinking more and more and more, it's probably not just because you're you like getting drunk. It's because it's finally like you can yeah. relax. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, but so, it's yeah. also a major depressant too. So it's the probably, next day your anxiety is ten times worse. Yeah, though. exactly. Yeah. It's yeah, just like you're delaying say, it for yeah, you're yeah, just yeah. temporarily delaying. The hangover it. is like times. Well, 100. you're 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 delaying and amplifying it. Well, you so, get rid of hangover pretty easily. Yeah, just drink more. Yeah, just drink more. Yeah, just keep you drinking. Yeah. That's not how I work. I would die. <laughs> I would literally yeah, die. No, I, I'm, I'm fucking worse. <laughs> I was joking with one of my friends about it. It's like when when I first joined the military, uh, we would do brigade runs, and that's like five thousand people, so they're super slow. Mm -hmm. So when I first joined the military, it's like, oh, we're doing a brigade run tomorrow. Let's get fucking wasted. <laughs> you get super shitty drunk, go to bed at three, wake up at five, and you're, you're just going to yeah. run six miles super slow, whatever. I can do that in my sleep, yeah. literally. Um, <laughs> then when I got back from Iraq, <laughs> hey, we have a brigade run tomorrow. All of the veterans that, like, that had just come back were like, oh, okay, I'll be in bed by eight then. Yeah. Yeah, like, seriously, I, I don't do so I can't good in the manage morning. that yeah. at yeah. all. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I unfortunately have no, another fine. guest coming at 1230, but I have thoroughly enjoyed this and thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you both yeah. so much for doing this. This was like very informative. And for anybody out there, I know you guys have said it multiple times, like for anybody out there who feels like they're experiencing trauma, post-traumatic tra trauma, post-traumatic stress, any of that, any of those things, TBI, CTE, anything. Uh, and if you're, if you're a veteran, just you can call the, or you can call suicide hotlines or civilian suicide hotlines. Yeah. If you just Google it, if you got a phone and there's and any time you call any number from the VA, the first thing it asks you is you're having suicidal thoughts hit seven. Okay. Like any number that you'll call in the VA. Yeah. I don't care if you're calling about a GI bill or a prescription or just trying to make an appointment. They always put the automated message. Okay. So call one of those numbers. Okay. Like if you're having that type, if you're in that space, because you're you're not trying to solve your problems right now. You're just trying to survive the day. Right. And surviving the day means you got an opportunity to solve your problems. Yeah. So don't, yeah. don't be afraid to reach out. The other thing I'd say, even if you're not at that point, like we all have friends on social media yeah. that we deployed with, that we're in the military with. Mm -hmm. Like I guarantee if you reach out to your old lieutenant, you reach out to your old sergeant, you reach out to just one of your battle buddies, like... I'm they'll, gonna go see one of my buddies soon. Yeah. Like, yeah, he's still in the military. He's a master chief down in Georgia. Like, yeah. he's like, I'm gonna go hang out with him. But they'll be yeah. there. Like, yeah, great. guys don't always proactively like, hey, how are you doing? Right. Like, that's not normal. Not I was actually <laughs> telling my girlfriend, like, that's not normal. We usually are just like, yeah. I haven't seen you in seven years. How you been? Good. Cool. Want to get a drink? Yes. I know like, you're. Yeah. That's it. So if you're proactive, if you're struggling proactive, reach out to somebody that's like a, a veteran as well, or someone that's still in the military, and talk to them. They'll have your back. Like, yeah. yeah, it's an honor to do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you both seriously so much for being here today, and for those of you who are listening, um, please like and subscribe. Uh, leave us a five star review, five stars only, please. Thank you. Um, if you want to find us, we are on every podcast platform: um, Spotify, I iTunes, uh, and on YouTube for video. Thank you guys for listening. Bye.